provided by the care minister, Helen Waitley. Ms Waitley, good to have you on, as always. And, uh, of course, loads to talk about on, on your brief specifically. But before we do, I, I think we just need to reflect that which we were hearing about the hospitality sector. <sighs> Businesses in the nighttime economy have, on average, made you know, almost 40% of their staff redundant. What, what support is going to be available to the nighttime sector uh, when the economy does eventually reopen? I mean, it's, it's clearly absolutely true to say that uh, the hospitality sector and the nighttime sector has been so hard hit by the pandemic and by the restrictions. I mean, what we know is already there's been a package of £280 billion worth of support to the economy from the Chancellor, from the government. And as of next week on Monday, the Prime Minister is going to be setting out the plan for how we come out of lockdown. Uh, so to me, that's a really important thing for us to be uh, step by step, step and doing this cautiously, of course, because we want this to be the last ever national lockdown. But step by step for us to be taking forwards, um, coming, coming out of these restrictions, you know, firstly getting children back to school, but in due course, opening up hospitality and getting back to life more like normal. I, I suppose part of the problem has been, of course, the government having finite resources and determining where they were to go. You know, before the vaccine rollout started, it was very difficult to see how the nighttime economies could get back to anything approaching nor normality. I mean, you, you appeared on the show uh, back at the tail end of September and you know, said the following, it, it, it doesn't make sense to continue supporting jobs where there, there simply isn't work at the moment. Was that, though, perhaps an oversight? given the fact that we have seen almost four in ten workers in that sector losing their jobs? Well, I mean, as I said, I think you know, the important thing is that in the weeks and months ahead, we take the steps to come out of lockdown, to move on from the restrictions that we've had to have over the, the last you know, months, most of the last year. I mean, we've, we're in a much, much better place now. We've had nearly 16 million people vaccinated. That's a huge deal. We have an enormous testing capacity as well. Um, we've learned a huge amount about the virus. We've got better treatments for it as well. Um, so I see us being in a much better place uh, as we come through this. But we will, of course, hear more from the Prime Minister on Monday. Yeah, a, a huge deal and indeed a, a huge achievement, of course. Um, uh, the, the route out of all of this, though, is, is of course where the focus is and specifics will come on Monday. I, I understand that. Uh, but as you said, we will want this to be the last national lockdown. The signal from central government has been that we want to be relaxing things on a, on a national basis. Uh, some suggestion, though, in the papers this morning that, that if there were to be an outbreak, we could see a return to, to localised lockdown conditions. What's your view on that? Well, I'd say probably wait until next week, until uh, when the Prime Minister sets out that roadmap for how we're going to come through it. Um, but you know, we have clearly learned a huge amount. We learned during the summer about how to you know, manage localised outbreaks and take that approach. Um, but I, I don't really want to preempt what we're going to hear next week. Sure, I thought I thought that might well be the response. Um, well, let's let, let's talk about schools, are we? Of course, uh, March the eighth, big date for for many many people, <laughs> not least not least the parents and all of this. Uh, and again, we know that testing in schools is going to be is going to be part of the, the way we move out of all of this. But we're now being told that we could be seeing teachers in secondary schools administering one set of tests, and then the responsibility being put onto the parents, at least for for secondary school students. Uh, well, first, let me say, I mean, I, like, like many uh, thousands of parents, I'm really looking forward to when schools go back. I've got three children at home, homeschooling, and I think as all of us know who are doing that, it's not the easy thing, thing, thing to do and uh, gives you even more respect than you already had for the teachers who usually uh, teach your children and, in fact, have been doing an amazing job providing online support during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we're looking forward, to, the plan is to, for schools to be able to uh, start going back on the 8th of March. Um, and again, next week more will be set out about how the return to school is going to work. I, I, I understand that, but one thing we can say with certainty is, you know, from that REACT study that's out at the moment, <sighs> Clearly, some of the greatest transmission that is taking place, or the highest amount of transmission that's taking place, is, is taking place in children. It is taking place in, in younger people. Now, that may well be a result of the fact that they're not in school, that they're associating at home. But does that not give any pause for concern? Does that not give any pause ahead of the decision to reopen schools on March 8th? Well, I mean, what has been clear is that we will look at the data and the reason why 
we have put off saying what the roadmap's going to be until next week was to make sure that we had time to look at the data, uh, to, to know that we have vaccinated so many people, to be able to look at the impact of the national lockdown on rates, to also see how that has enabled hospitals to be in a better position to cope. And there's one reason why a level of caution is being counselled you know, to, to, to recognise the lockdown is going to, we're going to come out of it step by step because we still have over 20,000 people in hospital with COVID. We still had over a thousand new admissions on Saturday, for example. So no, this isn't over yet, though we have this you know, fantastic situation we're in of nearly 16 million people vaccinated, the vaccination program going at such a tremendous pace. And there's a brilliant job being done by the NHS and by volunteers, some of whom I've met um, who are supporting the vaccine program. Uh, but we are gonna have to take the step by step. But what we've always said is we're determined to bring back schools as quickly as we can, because we know that being out of school is not the good thing for children's education. It's so much better for children to be in school. Uh, and that's really important that we try and get that to happen. Um, tell us a little bit, Minister, about the additional funding uh, that's going to be made available for, for, for looking at long COVID. I mean, clearly it is a condition of concern for, for all of us, but particularly, of course, uh, for those people who've been working on the front line and have contracted COVID through you know, doing their job and looking after the rest of us. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I mean, what we were seeing is about one in 10 people uh, suffering from some form of long COVID. So having some symptoms that go on for three months or more, quite a range of symptoms. Um, but you know, some are really making a, a, a really tough to uh, live with. And so we need to understand more about this uh, illness and how long COVID affects people and also how to sort of treat people and support people. That's one reason why today we're announcing 18 million pounds more going into research into long COVID and exactly that, how we can help support people and treat people and help people through it. I, I'm part of the reason, Minister, of course, that I, that I mentioned those working on the front line. Some, some really interesting data out today about uh, people applying to become uh, nurses, nursing applications are in fact up by a third. You know, I've got to say, slightly surprising to me that in the middle of a viral pandemic, you know, people are, are wanting to go out there and help, but actually perhaps it's, it's not desperately surprising, the British public uh, rallying together. Well, I think you, you put it exactly right there, and I'm really glad that you've brought this up, that um, we're seeing from the UCAS figures out today that we've had a third up, a uh, third increase of applications to study nursing degrees. Um, so we've had nearly 50,000 people apply to study nursing already to start this autumn, which is you know, tremendous news for, for me with oversight of the NHS workforce. It's a really big deal because I want us to make sure we have more nurses, that we have the workforce that we need, and we have 50,000 more nurses coming to the NHS by the end of this parliament. So you know, this is really important for the NHS. But exactly as you say, it's a real reflection on how people have seen the fantastic job that the NHS and actually social care workers have done throughout this pandemic and want to step up and join them and have got that sense of public service, of commitment and wanting to help others. So you know, overall, I think it's really, really good news and a real testament to how our health and social care system has been coping in this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, of course, another another sector and one that you're directly responsible for that, that we need to see more people going into is, of course, um, uh, the care professions. I mean, we, we learned yesterday, and I know this will be frustrating to you, uh, but we learned yesterday that the social care plan, you know, that Boris Johnson promised back when he was became prime minister in July 2019, has again somewhat been kicked into the long grass. No action being taken on that, as I understand it, until at least the end of the year. Can you just provide some reassurance to those who have family members in care homes who are perhaps working in social care themselves that we are actually going to start doing this at some point? Because, you know, the party has been in power since 2010 and we have had a number of promises on social care. Everyone understands pandemics get in the way of things, but it does feel like oh. once again social care is, is not where it should be. I mean, absolutely. And I remember it was it was roughly a year ago that the prime minister asked me to take on the job of being care minister. And then the job was very much going to be driving forward our ambitions for social care reform. Then we've had the pandemic and inevitably we've had to focus all our resources and attention um, on on helping social care through this really, really difficult time. But we are absolutely determined that we're going to take forward social care reform. There is work going on on this. We're going to come out with our plan during the course of this year. We've seen you know, absolutely that the social care system needs it. It's been really tough for social care to get through this pandemic. And so you know, I'm determined 
that coming through this, we will get to a better place for social care and make sure we get to a care system that everybody knows is going to be there for them and give them the care that they need. And also as part of that, make sure that we really give the social care workforce the recognition and the support that they deserve for the really tough job, but actually really rewarding job that they are doing too. Uh, well, look, people are, are, are waiting for that and they are eagerly waiting for that and they have been, they have been eagerly waiting for, for quite some time. Um, but just one last question on, on care homes. Um, 95%, I think I was over the end of the, the end of January, but 95% of care home residents had had their first vaccine. What is the earliest possible moment that people will be able to go and see their relatives in care homes? I really, really want to open up visiting in care homes more. I mean, to be clear, we have made sure that visiting can continue even during this national lockdown, mm -hmm. but I recognise it's not the normal kind of visiting. It's having to use screens or visiting sure. pods or through windows if care homes don't have those facilities. I would say we have put funding into social care to help care homes uh, have these facilities and have extra staff if they need to uh, supervise. But what I want to do as we come out of the national lockdown is also increase the amount of visiting. Um, I don't see that we uh, have to wait for the second vaccination dose. I want us to open up sooner than that. But I will say with this, as with generally as we come out of lockdown, we do have to be cautious. Um, say residents, most residents in care homes have only had their first dose and some of them only very recently. So it will be step by step, but I'm determined so that we can see people you know, go back to to, to no, even if it's to be able to hold hands again and to, to see somebody who you haven't been able to see very much in the last few months um, and over no, the last year, I really want to make that happen again. Minister, I know we've got to let you go, but just for clarity, when you say second dose, do you mean second dose for all of us or second dose for care home residents? I meant for care home residents. Great. Thank you, Minister. Great to have you on the programme. Thank you.